Back in the 90s, Bart Simpson told us to eat my shorts. McDonald's told us, I'm loving it. Nike told us, just do it. And L'Oreal told us, you're worth it. Some people wear T-shirts with things on them like, I'm going to get to the right side. Didn't want to be on the wrong side. I'm with stupid. I'm glad I don't see anyone in church this morning wearing that T-shirt. Some more I found was hard work never killed anybody, but why take the chance? Maybe this one applies to you, applies to me at the moment. Last name hungry, first name always. That apply to you? And this one really applies to me this week, I tell you. It says, I really need a day between Saturday and Sunday. Anybody else like that? And here's another one that I, I, I don't know whether this one is true or not, but I think the lads will tell you that it probably is true or applicable to me, but, you know, I don't know. But it, maybe, I don't know. It says, I may be wrong, but it's highly unlikely. Does that apply to me? No, it doesn't, does it? One of my personal favorites is, and this is great, and you might like this one too, and if I was to get a T-shirt done, I might actually get this one. It says, sorry I'm late. I didn't want to come. Does that apply to you? Ever apply to you in a situation? Yeah. I think every one of us that one's applied to. Just one more. And again, I've had this one too. My job is top secret. Even I don't know what I'm doing. We find all of these slogans on T-shirts and posters and coffee cups, and we laugh at them because they, they are funny. But a, a, another thing that we find on T-shirts and coffee cups is Bible verses. Anybody have a coffee cup at home with a Bible verse on it? I think every one of us probably do have a coffee cup somewhere in our home that we have an encouraging Bible verse on. Or maybe you're like me, and the first thing that you will see when you come into your home is a scripture on the wall, and, and we have one at home. Uh, it's uh, one that we've had on our, on our wall for 18 years now, and it's Joshua 24, 15. It says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's been hanging on our wall in our home for as long as we're in there, for about 18 years now. And that's one of what we would say our go-to scriptures, one of the scriptures that that we stand on. And I, I, I'm saying, I'm looking at you all today, and I'm saying every one of you has a go-to scripture. You all have a scripture that you use when you need to be encouraged. You go straight to it, your encouragement scripture, or someone comes to you and they're needing encouragement, and you have this scripture that you give people to encourage. Our, we call them our go-to scriptures. And what we're going to do in this new series is I'm going to challenge you to go a little bit deeper and discover what God is really saying to us through this commonly used, often misquoted and misrepresented, frequently used out of context scriptures. Some people say that coffee cup Christianity is killing our biblical literacy today. Literally, coffee cup, you know, when your scripture is on your coffee cup. We have become so used to seeing isolated Bible verses on our coffee cups and on posters and on postcards and all this sort of stuff that we presume that we know what they actually mean. But unfortunately, way too often what we've done is, is we've made up our own meanings of what these Bible verses actually mean. And what that does is we're actually overwriting what God is trying to tell us in these verses. So what we're going to do in these next few weeks in this series, we're going to have a deep dive and a, and a look at some of these uh, very commonly used, often misquoted verses that we all pull out of the Bible. Church, it is so important for us to truly understand the context of Scripture and for us to rightly discern what God is saying to us through those Scriptures, not just us making up in our own mind what this Scripture looks like, or not for us just to take a Scripture out of the Bible and take it completely out of context to try and make it mean what we wanted to mean at that time. 2 Timothy 3.16 in the New Living Translation says that all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives, to correct us when we are wrong 
and to teach us to do what is right. I want to start out today with a firm favor of Christians and believers and non-believers the world over. And that scripture is Philippians 4.13. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have it on our fridges. We have it hanging in our walls on pictures in our homes. We have it on our screensavers, on our computers. Some of us might even have it as a tattoo on our body. I don't want to know. It is one of the most recognized Bible verses out there. Unbelievers even know this verse. It has been in the top three in, of internet searches for as long as we've had Google. Way back in 1997, this is for the men here. I don't know, maybe women like boxing too. But in 1997, Evander Holyfield took on the reigning world boxing champion, Mike Tyson, in the MGM Grand in, in, in Las Vegas. The challenger, Evander Holyfield, many of you might know, is a devout follower of Jesus. Always has been. And even then, he was too. And in this fight, Evander Holyfield had plastered all over him, himself Philippians 4.13. He had it on his gum shield, as far as I know. He had it on his shorts. You can see it there on his shorts, but I'm not blocking it with my head. He had it on his socks, on his boots. He even had it, I believe, on his gloves. So every time he was hitting Mike Tyson, he was hitting him with the Word of God. I like that. Amen? <laughs> if you're going to hit someone, at least hit him with the Word of God. Amen? That doesn't mean you should go out and get Philippians 4.13 tattooed on, on your fist. Amen? Does, doesn't make violence right. If you're a boxing fan, you'll know that this fight was infamous. It's, it's, it's historical even today. It's historical for one reason, uh, well, one main reason. It's the fight that Evander Holyfield had half of his ear bitten off by Mike Tyson. Now, I know, ladies, you might not like boxing and stuff like that, but that doesn't happen that often. Uh, he had a part of his ear bitten off by Mike Tyson during this fight. Mike Tyson got, got uh, um, disqualified from the fight. Evander Holyfield, Holyfield won the world title. So this, in reality, then, it proves, doesn't it? Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength to be right. Yes? Yeah? Well, you'd think it would, wouldn't you? Well, Holyfield, a couple of years later, in the fifth defense of his title, he came up against a British boxer by the name of Lennox Lewis. And in the ring that night against uh, um, um, Lennox Lewis, Holyfield wore the very same gear. He had the scripture on his shorts, on his gloves, on his boots, and probably even on his gum shields, Philippians 4.13. He had it on his robe while he walked out into the ring that night. The same gear as he wore when he beat Mike Tyson. But this night, this night, Lennox Lewis beat him. He lost. He was defeated. How could that be? Wasn't he wearing the same Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength? Well, then how could he have been defeated? How could he have lost that fight? Can there be some times when all things don't mean all things? You see, here's how we have trained ourselves to believe. If God doesn't give me the strength to do all things, then how can I trust that He will give me the strength to do anything? And you see, that's a problem, isn't it? The Word of God says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, but the all there in all things might not mean the all that you want it to mean. Are you confused yet? If you're not, just give me a few more minutes. I'll even make you more confused. But stick with me. We're going someplace. To understand this verse, we need to look at this verse in context. Okay? Because what we've been doing is we've just grabbed this scripture there. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And we've plastered it on our t-shirts, plastered it on our coffee cups, plastered on our boxing gloves and our robes, and, and think that because we have this scripture that it should mean exactly what it says. Not that it doesn't. Let's look at it in context. Philippians 4 and chapter, sorry, Philippians 4 verse 12. Paul speaking, he says this, he says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned a secret in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, 
with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. At the moment, verse 18, let's skip down a bit. He says, at the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts that you sent me through Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches, which he has been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now all the glory to God our Father forever and ever. Amen. Okay. In order to first understand this passage, we need to look at the background. Okay. Let's not just do like journalists do today where they just pluck a scene out of whatever is going on and they just present it to be the whole story. Let's not be like journalists who will just take one quote out of someone's speech and just say that's exactly what he meant and take it completely out of context. Anybody ever see that? Yeah. Let's not be like that. Amen? Let's know the background. So in order to understand this passage, we need to look at the background, the circumstances that Paul was writing this passage to us. And he was living at the time in Rome. And he was under house arrest. Now, house arrests mean that he couldn't leave his house. He was under 24-7 guard in Rome. And he was expecting any day to be called by the emperor to give a defense for himself. Because remember back over in Acts, when the Jews were about to tear Paul apart. And Paul, when he was brought into the garrison, he said, you know, I, I plead my case before, before Caesar. So they had to take him in because he was a Roman citizen. They had to send him to Rome so that his case could be heard by Caesar. So this is two years down the line now. And Paul is still under house arrest, awaiting to be called by Caesar, and in that, not knowing what was going to happen. He didn't know what the outcome of this whole situation was going to be. Paul's life was literally in the hands of Caesar. He didn't know whether Caesar was going to call him today, next week, next month, or maybe not for another few years. But even in that, he didn't know what the outcome would be, whether Caesar would pardon him or whether Caesar would have him killed. So Paul is writing this letter, and in this passage to the new church, to these new Corinthians, or new Christians, should I say, in Philippi, a church that Paul had planted sometime earlier. Now, Paul knew by the Holy Spirit that this church wasn't doing well. He knew they were going through some stuff. He knew they were, that they were struggling with this new Christianity. You see, the church in Philippi were, were the, and the people in Philippi, they were very independent spirited. They liked to take care of their own business. They liked to take care of the stuff that was going on in their own lives. So, so by this living by faith stuff was difficult for them. Paul had gone there and planted the church and told them that they were to live by faith and trust God with the circumstances and the situations in their lives. But they were struggling in this. They were finding that difficult. And what was happening was that the situations that were coming up in their lives, instead of them trusting fully with God, they were trusting in their own strength. And how many people know that when you trust God in one hand or half of one hand and, and trust your own strength with the other hand, that, that ain't going to work out well for you, is it? No. And what was happening there is th this self-reliance that they had instead of God-reliance wasn't going well for them. And this self-confidence was causing them to worry about their situation. It was causing them to be agitated because things weren't working out for them the way that they wanted them to work out. And it was causing them to be irritated with each other because of, you know, they weren't getting the answers that they wanted from God and they were having to work for stuff. It's causing them to be irritated with each other and was causing strife in this young church. Does it sound like anything that maybe we would go through in our walk of faith? Yeah, it does. Because sometimes we all worry about money, don't we? Or the lack thereof. Sometimes we all get annoyed when things don't work out for us or happen in the way that we want them to happen. Sometimes we get frustrated with each other when, when the, the thing I asked you to do wasn't actually the thing that God wanted you to do or wanted 
me to do, or, or we just get frustrated, don't we, when things don't work out the way we want them to work out. We all experience the same, experience this same kind of feelings that the church at Philippi were going through, don't we? You know, in our walk with God, we do. And the consequences of that is that it produces this kind of like self-reliance and this self-confidence in our own abilities to fix things and figure things out on our own without God. Because who knows that if there's something going on in my life, I, I'll pray, I'll ask God, but sometimes, you know, you can feel like, well, maybe I should just go and, and fix this myself or work and, you know, sort this, move these things myself. And that's not how faith works, amen? And when it doesn't work out for us, the way we had planned it to work out for us, we start to wonder, was all of this stuff true? Did God really say I could do all things through Christ who gives me strength? And Paul's response to the Philippians, and you can read it for yourself. Philippians is just four chapters. You'll read it in about 25 minutes and one sitting if you want. Let me encourage you to do that. His response is, in this life, you are going to have to be stubborn. Anybody good at being stubborn? Don't put your hand up. Some of us can get so stubborn when someone asks us to move a cup that's left on the coffee table that you say it's not mine. And you say, well, you just move it anyway. No, it's not mine. I didn't leave it there. But you just move it anyway. Nope. Someone can get so stubborn not to move their socks that they left under the table for the 10th time in a few weeks. But they're fed up with someone telling you, well, you won't tell me what to do. Some of us can be so good and so stubborn with the things of this world that I wish that maybe we could transfer a little bit of that stubbornness into our walk with God. Because if we want God to move in our lives, we've got to be a little bit stubborn, amen? Because how many people know that when you pray the first time, it doesn't always come, amen? Nor the second or the fifth or the tenth. So in this life, when troubles come, when issues come, when there's things that we're trusting God for and praying, God, praying to God and asking God for, maybe we just need to be a little bit more stubborn and hold on to that faith and say, you know, I'm not letting it go. I'm not letting this thing go. I believe you, God. I'm trusting you, God. I've, I've used your word, God. You said I could have this in your word, God. I'm not letting it go. I wonder, do we not see our prayers answered as often as we would like because we let them go. Oh, we pray. We trust God. We might even fill out on a prayer request form, drop it into the basket. But I wonder, do we have that stubborn spirit that we need that we're just not letting it go? God, if you promised it, I'm holding on to that promise. I think we're a little bit like the Philippians, aren't we? We pray and we ask God, but then after a few days or maybe a few hours even, we're trying to work it out ourselves. That will not work out well for us. Amen? We need to be stubborn and we need to stand and we need to not be moved. We need to hold on to our faith in Jesus. We're going to have to persevere under pressure to give up. And we have to press in to Jesus. And if we do all of that, he will come true for us if we don't give up. Amen? We've got not to give up. Amen? It's like I go around the countryside today and I see half-built houses. Anybody else see those half-built houses? I mean, they've gotten them right up maybe to the roof level. Some have even got roofs on. But you look at them today and they're all overgrown because whoever was building them gave up for one reason or another. Maybe they ran out of money. Maybe there was a relationship difficulty or a breakup or whatever. But they gave up on it. Let's not be the ones who give up, amen? I mean, when we start to pray and ask God in the first place, we're laying the foundation, amen? And then every time we continue to thank God for the thing we've asked Him for, we're building on it. Amen? We're building on it. We're building on it, amen? And if we keep trusting God and we keep being stubborn and we keep holding on to that promise of God, we will eventually get the keys, amen? Amen? We need to be stubborn because living by faith is not always easy. Amen? It's not always easy. 
But God wants to develop in us and He wants to grow faith in us. And sometimes that, that faith will only grow in us when we go through some stuff. Amen? We got to learn to persevere and to trust God in the trials. God wants us to really understand that despite all the tr trials that we go through in life, we got to trust in Him and keep on trusting in Him. Amen? We got to keep on standing. We got to keep on persevering. We got to keep on being stubborn in Him. Amen? Church, I don't know if this is news to you or not this morning. Maybe it is. I hope it's not. But God never promised us a rose garden. Amen? He never promised us that we wouldn't go through stuff in life. Amen? In actual fact, we were guaranteed that we would go through stuff in life. John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus himself said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace, but in the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. God wants us to understand that we can thrive in this life even if we go through some stuff. That we can still thrive in this life because we have a relationship with Him. And we will not let Him go. Amen? In the world, unfortunately, we can expect trouble. It's unavoidable. But Jesus said, cheer up. I have conquered the world. I have overcome the world. And this is the revelation that Paul was living out in his life. He was saying, God's got it. No matter what I go through, God's got it. No matter what I go through, no matter whether I'm left here to rot for another two years, God's got it. No matter whether I'm brought out tomorrow and found guilty by Caesar and executed, God's got it. No matter what you go through, no matter what trial, no matter what pressure, no matter what trouble you go through, God has got it. Can we let that sink down in our spirits this morning, just for a few seconds, that whatever you're going through, God has got it. You are not going through anything that God has not got. Maybe for in your, a minute in your own mind this morning, just put a name to that it. God has got it. God's got this sickness. God's got this need. God has got this financial worry. God's got this anxiety and this irrational fear. Just put a name on it yourself. Whatever is the difficulty, the trouble that you're going through, go ahead and name it. God has got it. God's got it, amen? Matthew chapter 8 and verse 17 in the Easy English Bible, it says, He took away everything that makes us weak. He carried away everything that makes us ill. So here we have Paul, and he's living under house arrest in Rome, and he doesn't know what day he's going to be sent for to give account for his life, and he doesn't know what the result of that account is going to be. He doesn't know whether he's going to live or whether he is going to die. Get that into your heads for a minute. Imagine living underneath that kind of duress, that kind of stress, and somehow, Paul is still able to live a contented life. Imagine that. In verse 11 of Philippians 4, Paul lets us in on his secret formula for this kind of contentment. He says, Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live with almost nothing, or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. Paul's advice to the Philippian church and to us believers today is to learn to be content. 
Paul is saying, I have learned to be content. Even if you're dealing with something, we've got to learn to be content and remind ourselves in that something that God has got it. Amen? Even in the circumstances Paul found himself, he had learned to be content. Church, contentment has all to do with the condition of our relationship with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Did you get that? Our contentment has everything to do with the condition of our relationship with God and Jesus. We need to strengthen our relationship with God. Amen? Only God provides the strength and the power to be content in this life when things are not ideal. And only God can give us the power not to worry. Only God. But it is essential for us to get as close to God as we possibly can. We've got to get, got to get close to God. John chapter 15 and verse 5. Jesus speaking. He says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It is only when you stick to the Father like glue, like glue, that you will find this peace, this fruitfulness, and this contentment. You know when the prodigal son was living at home, he was close to the father. He was living in the same house as the father, eating at the same table as the father, sleeping in a, roof, in a bed under the same roof as the father. He worked with the father, saw the father 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He was provided for, he was prosperous, and he was safe. He had curtains on his windows. He had more food than he could eat. I mean, he had people serving him, taking care of him, looking after him. But when he drifted away from his father and decided that he should do life on his own, he ended up in lack. He ended up in poverty and in danger. But when he came to his senses, or as we say, when he copped on and thought to himself, even my father's servants are better looked after than I am. The people, can you imagine that actually? Imagine the situation he found himself in on the side of a hill with the pigs. Longing to eat the food that the pigs were eating. Now let's, let's be honest here now. The food that the pigs were eating wasn't choice meat, wasn't choice vegetable, wasn't choice food by no means or no stretch of the imagination. But he longed to eat what was only fit for pigs to eat. And the light went off. Even the people that are serving my father are better looked after than I am. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to the father and I'm going to say, Father, just take me on as a servant. He was willing to trade his blood relationship with the Father for that of a servant. Luke chapter 15 and verse 17 says, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to eat and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against, against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. The prodigal son realized that he could only be blessed and content when he got close to the Father. When we drift from the Father, we end up in lack. We end up in poverty. We end up in danger. Church, we need to stick close to the Father. So, does Philippians 4.13 not apply to us today? It absolutely does. But we need to keep it in context. Amen? I mean, 
I don't know what you do during the week when you're not here. <clears throat> and I don't know, but maybe some of you will get an opportunity to line up against Usain Bolt in a 100-meter race. I'm looking at a few potential candidates. But if you ever get that opportunity to line up against Usain Bolt in a 100-meter race, can I tell you, you can put Philippians 4.13 on your shorts if you want. You can put them on your runners if you want. But I guarantee you, you will not beat Usain Bolt in a 100-meter race. Amen? But does that mean that you can't do all things through Christ who gives you strength? No. You can. But you need to keep it in context. Amen? You need to keep it in context. We need to trust God. We need to believe God. We need to keep close to God. We need to be stubbornly holding on to the things of God. Amen? We can't just use this scripture out of context and when we line up in a race against Usain Bolt. I hope you do. But praise God if you, if you ever do. You need to keep it in context. Amen? Amen? You'll go through stuff in life. And Philippians 4.13 is not your get out of jail card. Amen? Amen? It's a scripture that we need to stick close to God. Hold fast to Him. Trust God. Believe God. Believe His Word. Amen? Exercise His Word. And when we don't see the answer coming through, stubbornly hold on to the Word of God. Amen? And we need to always use the Word of God in context. Trusting in God. Amen? Learn to rightly apply God's word. We need to rightly apply it. As with any medication, as with anything, you gotta rightly apply it. And if it doesn't, if it's not rightly applied, it doesn't work. We can't decide that we want this scripture to work this way for us when God gave us this scripture a different way. Amen? Amen. We gotta rightly learn to divide the word of God. Amen?